I was prompted a few years ago, I was in my reading, uh, my morning reading and my study, and I happened to be in Ephesians chapter 3 this particular day. And I read something in Ephesians 3 that a prayer, the, a prayer of, of Paul for the believers in Ephesus that struck me so, so strongly, I, I actually memorized it and have incorporated it, not every morning, but in my prayer time because of the, because of the imagery that it brings to me when I recite this prayer. But I, before I get to the prayer, I want to just give you a little background in Ephesians chapter 3 because honestly, I think, and I'm including myself in this, I think we, uh, in our minds, have over the years, I don't think, I don't know that this happens in the mission field as much as it happens in America, where our lives have been so comfortable for so long, and we've had so little opposition to the Christian faith that we've not had to build, we've not had to build those muscles of resistance. And I think we're fast moving into those, those times. I don't know if any of you have watched the news uh, uh, like I have over the last couple of days, but, but Europe is, is, is in flames. I mean, uh, groups of marauding Muslims are in England, in cities in England, brandishing swords and, and machetes, knives, and axes, are, are going after Brits who would, who would stand in resistance. I mean, it's just, the, the world's in a mess. It's getting crazy, and it's gonna be crazier probably unless we see the kind of revival that we've been praying for. But it's time for us to, it's time for us to get hold of the fact that, that when we gather together, something supernatural is going on. That I don't think we have, I, and I've pastored for a long time now, I don't think I have a full grasp of the importance spiritually of what happens when the body of Christ gathers. Not just in a Sunday service, but in small groups, in gatherings, in homes. Uh, whenever the body of Christ comes together, there's some things going on that God has built into us that is part of his strategy and program from the beginning of time. Paul calls it in Ephesians chapter 3, the mystery of God that has been kept secret and is now revealed in Paul's time. And it's, it, it really, when you, when you let your mind and your heart just dwell on it, it's, it's mind-boggling. This mysterious plan that God set, kept secret from the beginning of time is that, quote, his, his, God's intent was that now through the church, and I put this, my parenthesis there, local, and I want to say this, and I want you to hear me, there is really no church but local church. Okay? I know people talk about, I've talked to folks at times and they say, well, well, what church are you, do you go to? Oh, well, I'm just part of the universal church. And I have to just stop short of giving them the raspberries, right? Because that, that means I want to float around like a hummingbird and get a little nectar here and a little nectar there. And I'm not locked in anywhere. The, the universal church, I mean, it does exist, obviously, because God sees one church, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. So it does exist. But in terms of his intention for us, there is no church but the local church. So his intention was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to rulers and authorities in heavenly realms. So when, when I, I feel like words fall short of me being able to capture for you the significance of what it means for you to be part whether you're a member or not, but at least tied in, connected, more than just popping in on a Sunday, that you are intrinsically a part, known and being known, part of the body of Christ and living, doing life together is in, has incredible significance when we are worshiping together. Something's going on in the heavenlies. When we pray together, there are things happening in the heavenlies. When we do ministry side by side, 
things are going on in the heavenlies, when we resolve conflict with each other, walk through stuff together, rub like iron sharpening iron on each other, something's happening in the heavenlies. When we love each other in spite of our differences culturally or ethnically or however socioeconomically or maybe even politically, when we're able to work through those differences together, all of us redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, all of us filled with the Holy Spirit and walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. The powers and authorities, the righteous and the unrighteous in heavenly places look on in amazement. And they say, whoa, look at that. Look at that bunch of misfits. Look at that bunch of cobbled together. Who would ever, I mean, and if you feel badly about what I'm saying to you, think about the disciples right? The good, the bad, and the ugly were all 12 of them, right? Jesus picked all 12 and one of them denied him and others, and they all ran away when the, when the soldiers came to arrest him. So, so the, the, the powers of authority and authorities that are in heavenly places look on when we do life together and they are in, ama- in amazement. So Paul has just taken us through this stratospheric, spiritually almost unbelievable example of what's happening when local church functions together. And then he says, for this reason, he drops to his knees. Because the fact that he's caused us to be his family and his church should cause us to just drop to our knees. And that's what Paul does after he's just traveled with us through this magnificent exploration of what God is doing when we do local church together. And he drops to his knees. And this is the prayer that I memorize. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And the Greek there for name is not a noun. We're used to name being a noun. And I double checked in the, in the lexicon just to make sure I'm giving you accurate, accurate information. Literally, the ESV captures it the best when they write from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth is named. In other words, what, what, what Paul is recognizing is that everything that we are personally in our salvation and collectively as the body of Christ, everything we are, our Father has named. We have been named by him. It's the verb in the Greek there. It is the verb. So therefore, I bow my knee, Paul says, as he begins to pray for this body of believers. Because if we're going to be examples for principalities and powers in heavenly places to watch us do life together, then we're going to need prayer. Right? We're going to need, like Paul, to get on our knees and say, therefore, I bow my knees before the Father who has named us. Every family in heaven and on earth has been named by the Father. So that's why this series in 1 Peter is really exciting to me because we're, we're examining the identity of the believer. We're examining what Peter is writing in 1 Peter to a group of believers who have been wrenched out of their homes, wrenched out of Jerusalem, most of them Jewish believers, accustomed to the identity of their Jewishness and their Jewish theologies. And they've been ripped from that, ripped from their homes, ripped from their employment, ripped from everything that they would normally look to for a sense of identity. I was talking to a friend of mine, another pastor, and via emails just the, over the weekend, and he's considering retiring, and, and he asked me when I'm going to retire, and, and I said, well, I don't, I don't know. I'm really, I'm waiting on the Lord to tell me when it's time. I don't feel like, I've, especially since the battle seems so intense, I feel like I would be uh, laying my weapons down at a crucial time, but that's beside the point. Then he texted me back, emailed me back, and he said, well, most pastors statistically won't, don't retire for two reasons. One, they can't afford to retire. And two, they're they're afraid of losing their sense of identity. And I thought, wow, that goes right along with the message. Because if all of my identity is wrapped up in being pastor, 
then, then I'm in serious trouble. I need a sword because there'll come a time, and I've watched pastors go through this when they, when they retire. They, 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 they seem to lose all sense of who they are. No, no, I gotta be more than just what I do when I function here as the pastor of Westgate Chapel. I gotta be more than that. And Peter is trying to help these believers isolated from family and friends having been wrenched out of Jerusalem, living up in Bithynia and up along the coast of the Black Sea. And he's trying to help them see who they are. And I just want to unpack with you. I told you someday I'd like to have a t-shirt. Uh, we can't have a t-shirt for every one of these, but, but, I, but I, I want you to, maybe we can do those, you know, when they do a word study of a book in the Bible and there are certain words that are bigger than others. And so they're all there. We may do something like this, but I want to just walk with you through. I'm enough of an old school teacher. I want to review with you where we've gone so far in the sermon series. First of all, you were chosen, right? God chose you. In fact, the word there in 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2 literally means he voted for you. I know some of you, if you were here that Sunday, you heard it, but chosen, that's who you are. The world may not think much of you, but God chose you, right? He chose 12 disciples, like I said a moment ago, and some of them were, took a lot of learning and a lot of uh, encouragement to get through, but he chose them anyhow, right? He chose you. You say, well, you, you don't know how many times I've blown it and messed up. I, I know you don't know how many times I have, but he chose me anyhow. He, you are chosen, right? Then you are strangers. Now, that may seem like a weird uh, identification for you, but you're strangers. What Peter is saying there is that literally these folks have been wrenched out of Jerusalem as Jewish believers, and they're living in an alien culture. And America didn't used to be an alien culture, but it's becoming more and more alien. And I don't even have time to enumerate for you all the crazy ways we're looking around us thinking, is this really the world that our kids are growing up in? God, we need to have prayer meetings just for our children. And especially we'll do that when we get ready for going back to school. But oh my word, our kids are under attack like never before. Not a surprise. Children have been under attack since Genesis 3. So we're strangers. Don't get too comfortable here. Don't feel like this is all there is and this is your home. Don't get your identity from your house or your car or your career or your position or your title. We're strangers here. We're just passing through. We're going for a city whose builder and maker is God. I mean, I kind of like the little house Pastor Rita and I have, are living in right now. It just suits us to a T. And, and we, so we're kind of, we kind of take pride in the house and the yard and try to have it looking good. So if you drive by with your friends, you don't have to say, well, this is our pastor's house. But, but still, that house is nothing compared to the house that Jesus is preparing for me. Strangers. We're scattered. There's another t-shirt for you. We're scattered. And that just means that you're not, we're not saying you're scatterbrained. <laughs> what Peter is saying there is they've been scattered out of Jerusalem they would have liked to have huddled in Jerusalem their whole lives. And uh, I, know, I know I got irritated during COVID when, when all of my pastoral colleagues around the country were saying, well, gee, now we can see what the church is like outside of the four walls. Uh, and I'm, I'm thinking, no, no kidding, Sherlock. We, we've been outside of the walls for a long time. We don't need COVID to prove that. Right, but we, we are scattered. Salt and light works best when the salt is a preservative and light dispels darkness. And that can't just be in these four walls. It's intended to be taken out, not just in mission fields, although God has blessed us with that, but right in our communities, in our neighborhoods. Salt and light, we're scattered. We're born again, there's another t-shirt, so we can love and, and receive spiritual things. Until you're born again, spiritual things make no sense to you at all. We are heirs of God. That means the riches of who God is, experienced both in this life, but most importantly in the life to come, where neither rust nor moth corrupt, and there's no corrosion. 
right? You can have the best car in the world, but I got to tell you, the minute you drive that puppy off the lot, you've just suffered depreciation of almost a quarter of its value, and it's going to go down from there. Isn't it funny how when you're ready to trade, it never is worth what you thought it would be? We're an heir of God. Let's make sure that our putting, we're putting our treasure where, the, where our future is going to be. We're protected by God's power. Doesn't mean we don't take precautions to protect ourselves in an increasingly dangerous world. But, I, but basically, unless he guards the house, we're watching in vain. That's in the Bible. We're tested by trials. There is a t-shirt that, that, that may be a little difficult to wear, but we are tested, the trial, and they come our way by design that God would allow us to see the genuineness of our faith. And then the next t-shirt we'd wear is proven. I've been, we should put that one together, tested and proven. Tested and proven to be faithful. Tested and proven to be a child of God. And then the last two saved from darkness into light, from death into life. We have been saved by the power of the gospel. And then lastly, transformed so that we could live a holy life. That's quite an identity. You've been named by God. Those are some of the names. And I've got two more for you today. But those are some of the names God has given you. Wear them with a sense of honor. Wear them with a degree of importance to them. Because who you are to God is more important than how the world sees you and the titles the world gives you. They're all passing away. Who God sees you and who he's named you to be is what you have for all eternity. We'll walk through heaven for all eternity singing what he's done, what he's done. That's just the first thousand years. The next two will go to verse two. <laughs> so now turn with me to 1 Peter chapter, seven, chapter 1 verse 17. One of the most incredible identities of being a follower of Christ. Peter puts it this way. And it ties together with my prayer from Ephesians chapter 3. 1 Peter 1, 17. Since you call on a father. And I want you to stop right there. We're not going to go any further right now in that verse. Since he since you call on a father. This is the recognition. You know. Uh, you've picked up by now, if you've been around much at all, how much I respected and deeply loved my earthly father. Um, in my eyes, there was no one like him. No one could preach like dad. Uh, no one had passion for the things of God like my dad. Um, and at the same time, he was as much a man of God when we were, when he was in the, on the pulpit as he was when we were watching Formula One racing in South Africa. And so it was just, he was a man's man. We fished together. We worked on cars together. Uh, we prayed together. Uh, it was just my earthly father. In fact, when he passed away and my mom called and said, I don't want to put him in the ground without you here. We weren't, I wasn't planning on going back for his funeral because I had just visited with him a few months before. And when mom said that, right, when mom says, I don't want to put him in the ground without you, I got, my family was, we were in Arkansas on vacation at the time. And so I jumped on a plane in Little Rock and I headed back to, and I went with some degree of dread because I honestly, my dad meant so much to me that I honestly was worried I'd get to the casket and fall apart, right? But my brother picked me up from the airport in Johannesburg, and we drove down to Peter Maritzburg, where dad was going to be buried, and went into the funeral home and looked in the casket. And I got to tell you, even though by then I'd preached probably hundreds of memorial services and funerals, uh, I never realized it till I looked in that casket. I'm not trying to be morbid on you. But when I looked there, I thought, wow, <laughs> he's not there. I mean, I, I mean, I preached that before, right? But it suddenly dawned on me, I'm looking at a tent. I'm looking at an empty tent. And yes, when he was, when his spirit and his soul were, were in that, was in that, were in that tent, 
I mean, he was, he was just an amazing dad. I couldn't have asked for a better father and mother for that matter, but, but it just, it just struck me. And I was not overcome like I thought I would be because I realized that because of the faith that my dad put in the Lord all of his life, when that moment came that he went to be with the Lord, he went straight into the presence of the Lord. And someday we will be reunited. I don't know how I'll recognize him because he'll have a new body, but we will be, we'll be with the Lord, with those people. No wonder the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12, we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And what are those witnesses saying? That my dad is in that grandstand right now and he's cheering us on saying we can run the race too. Grab hold of the name that God has given you. Grab hold of the identity that you have in Christ Jesus and keep running the race until we get to the finish line and hear him say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. You see, once you were an an orphan, cut off from God, but now you've been adopted by God. Once you were unwanted and abandoned, but now you are welcomed as the child of God. Once you were rejected, cast off and turned away like the prodigal, but now the father just sees you coming from just the the furthest distance and runs, grabs his robe and runs towards you and wraps his arms around you and says, oh, my son, my son. You know, I remember, sorry to get personal on you, but I remember when dad was diagnosed with cancer and he was only three months from passing away at that point. And I flew back, the Westgate flew me back to, to spend three weeks with him, which are two, three glorious weeks. But, but as I walked in, he was, had not been hospitalized yet. So I walked into the house. He was coming out of the bedroom, pull, putting it, I can see him putting that paisley, uh, bathrobe, tying it around him. And he saw oh my, he said this to me, oh, my son. The devil told me I'd never see you again. And he wrapped his arms around me. That's what a father does. That's what our heavenly father does. And the na- and he's for he Paul writes about this in Ephesians where he says, for he, the father, chose us in him before the creation of the world. Paul uses the language of chosen also to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. I I grieve for those of you in this congregation and those watching online who had a, a really horrible experience in your childhood, I grieve for you, but I want you to know that the God who is your heavenly father can redeem and restore and renew even the worst of experiences you might have had. He, he blessed me beyond anything I deserved with the parents that I had. But, but honestly, my dad was just a, a, a fragile, I mean, he wasn't perfect, right? I remember with him one time trying to change the, the, the brakes in the old 49 Ford, and he had a wheel puller to get the discs off, and the, the brake drum, sorry, off, and, and he, the wheel puller goes around, the claws go around the, the drum, and then you have a, a nut you screw onto the end of the axle, and, and the tension pops the, the thing off, and, and the, those claws that hold the drum slip three times and my dad grabbed a hammer and hit the fender, put a big dent in the fender. So he wasn't perfect, right? But he's just a, he's just a small and fragile example of this earthly heavenly father, my earthly father, just an example of the heavenly father that you have. For he chose us and has adopted us as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. So back to 1 Peter. Peter tells you how you got the family name of son and daughter. Can you, Jake, can you turn me down for a second, please? (laughs) 
Look at verse 18 and 19. This is how you got the family name of son and daughter. For you know it was not with perishable things like silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Then look at verse 20, back to 1 Peter. He was chosen, Jesus, before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake, so that you may be adopted into this family as sons and daughters. Verse 21, through him, you believe in God who raised him, Jesus, from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. That's why we had the communion celebration. So then what's our obligation as sons and daughters of God? Since you call on a father, back to verse 17, who judges each man's work impartially, live your life lives as strangers here in reverent fear. You have an obligation as a son and daughter. It's wonderful to be sons and daughters. And I think it's curious, as I was prepping for this sermon, I thought about how Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And he didn't say, pray this way, my father, which art in heaven, right? And, and that, that's not because he isn't your father, but he wanted us to understand that this is a family unit that he's creating. And so when he taught his disciples to pray, he taught them our father, which are in heaven, because we need to recognize the family, the sons and daughters, family creation of God that each local church is to be. But, but I want to tell you, there's an obligation that goes with the privilege of being sons and daughters. I had an obligation to be a part of my earthly family. I remember I was 17 years old, standing on the deck of the SS Louise Likes, the Likes Lines was a freighter company that was headquartered in Mobile, Alabama. And it was the only way we could afford for me to come to Bible college. We couldn't afford airfare. So with my dad got, us, got me passage on a freighter, the SS Louise Likes. And I, I stood on the deck of that freighter. And there's a picture of it for you as we got ready to, to leave. And uh, it, was a, it was a bucket of bolts back then. And uh, I went, the last time I told the story, John Eason, who uh, used to work for the Likes Lines, was first mate on that same ship when it used to take supplies from San Francisco to Vietnam. They told us it was his last voyage because it was on its last legs. But, but I stood on the deck of that boat saying goodbye to my family, to getting ready to come to this country. I was 17 years old. And the last words out of my dad's mouth as he and the family disembarked before the boat left Durban, South Africa, he said to me, remember, Alec, remember you're a Rollins. Now, I don't know how that strikes you, but, but my parents had drilled into me all of my growing up years. Maybe you were raised the same way. We had drilled into me the significance of family and the importance of many of our family members who were devoted in South Africa to significant ministry. I've told you some of these stories before, but I had an uncle Jack Stead, uh, who was a cousin of my dad's, who devoted his life to building churches in Zululand, which was then a sub part of South Africa that was populated mostly by the Zulu people. And Uncle Jack Stead's calling was to the Zulu people. And I remember he drove an old green 1952 Studebaker with the big bullet and the grill. Remember those beautiful old cars? And, uh, excuse me, and, uh, uh, and, he would, he, would draw, he would go for months at a time up into Zululand and he would plant churches and literally built the churches with his own hands. We have pictures of him uh, not only laying those cinder blocks, but also pouring the concrete into molds for the, so they made the blocks on site with cement. When Uncle Jack died in his 80s, Uncle Jack Stead, his hands were all twisted up with, with cement poisoning and arthritis. And for him to even get hold 
hold of a spoon to feed himself. The surgeon would have to occasionally cut tendons in his arm and his fingers so that he could get his hand around a spoon and, and feed himself. But when Uncle Jack Stead passed away, there were about 40 churches in Zululand with Zulu pastors that he raised up and literally built with his own hands. And when we'd have family gatherings, Uncle Jack Stead would tell amazing stories about what the Lord was doing in the Zulu area. I have an Uncle Jack Rollins and his brother, Alec Rollins, after whom I'm named, who devoted him. When he, was, when he and his brother were 19 and 21, they stood at Bethesda, at the Bethesda pools in Jerusalem, looking down into the newly dug ruins of the pools of Bethesda. And the Holy Spirit called them to go back to South Africa, where their parents were, and plant a church with the Indian people. And I'll just give the short version is when Uncle Jack Rollins and Uncle Alec passed away in the late 1970s. And you can look this up online. Bethesda Temple was running about 16,000 believers, most in the main campus and then outlying satellite churches around Durban. All people coming out of the Hindu religion, all born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. Many demons cast out. It was an amazing ministry. And when Uncle Jack and Uncle Alec would, would visit, we'd sit and listen enthralled. I remember him telling me a story one time where he was visiting in a particular Indian area and ran into a roadblock of thugs that had a tree across the street and commanded him to get out of the car. And he said, I don't know what happened to me. He said, I got out of the car and began to pray in tongues. And they all scattered and ran every which direction. Just fearless, godly, men and women of God in the family. And when we were together as, as a family, we would, we would share these kinds of stories. The first time I preached at a conference of 25,000 pastors in India, a gentleman came up to me after the service and said, your uncle was visiting Delhi in 1955 and preached on this passage. And he told me what it was. And he said, I was a Hindu and gave my life to Jesus. Now I'm pastoring in the IPC. Just amazing story. Stories, right? So growing up, my parents would tell us these stories. And that's why my dad gave me that charge. He said, remember, you're, you're, you're a Rollins. You carry. That means when I came to this country, even though in my heart, I'm 17 turned 18 on the freighter. And I thought, woohoo, I'm the only one here. Nobody knows who I am. I'm going to party. <laughs> right? And somehow it never happened because I think mom and dad were interceding back there in South Africa. But, but the charge was, remember, you're carrying a name that carries meaning and integrity and honor. Uh, remember, you're carrying that name. Act accordingly. Right now. Now, in the terms of eternity, the name Rollins means very little. In terms of eternity, Carrying the name of sons of God, daughters of God. Now, now we're talking, which is why Paul writes to the Ephesians and he says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you, I urge you, live a life worthy of the calling you've received. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. Live a life worthy of that name that you carry. Paul tells the church in Philippi, whatever happens to me, Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We carry a name far more important than the earthly name. We may be grateful for our family heritage. We may want to run from our family heritage. Regardless of which of those it is, your, your name is a son of God, born again, daughter of God, chosen by God. Way more important than any earthly name you and I may carry. But Peter adds another identification to what it means to be sons and daughters of God. Verse 22, you were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other. <laughs> you know, if you just stop right there, you say, okay, well, I love you. Yeah, no, no. Love each other deeply and from the heart. So being a son or a daughter in God's family, one of the obligations it carries is how we treat each other. Because being a Christian is not just some passive 
uh, some passive embrace of, of biblical principles. Being a Christian is living the practical elements of our faith out in obedience to God. And this, this command of 1 first, first Peter 1 is a command from God that we're to love each other. So that identification is not just son and daughter, it's brother and sister. Can you see how heinous it is when any man, I'm not saying men are the only ones guilty of this, in any body of Christ takes advantage of another lady who is a sister in the body of Christ. Because that's, that's not just a woman with the attributes. That's, that is a sister in Christ. That's a daughter of the Heavenly Father. That's a sister in Christ. So it's, it's be, we're beholden to the Lord to treat our sisters with integrity and honor. You see how even more heinous it is when, when a leader, you know, I got to tell you another dad story. I'm sorry. I know I'm out of time, but this is, this is what my dad was like. He was one of the executive council eventually on the denomination in South Africa, full gospel church of God. And we had a Bible college principal who'd been busted sleeping with one of the female students in Cape Town. And the denomination disciplined him for six months. And then they were getting ready to put him back in that position again. And uh, I was probably 15, 14, 15, sitting with my parents in, a, in, a, in, a san in an auditorium with 3,000 ministers and delegates from all these churches. So we're sitting in a crowd of business meeting. Microphones are up front. Moderator is up on the platform. Chairman, everything's very dignified. And this debate's going on whether this gentleman should be should be restored just willy-nilly to his position he had before. And I remember my dad getting up from where we were sitting, and I remember as a, as a teenager, right, thinking, oh, boy, <laughs> right? And he gets up, and he has, my dad loved two things, watches and pens and cars and my mom. <laughs> um, but he had a gold and, and gray Schaefer pen, and as he got up and headed down the aisle to the microphone, he takes that pen out, screws the lid off, puts it on the, puts it on the back of the pen. And I wish I had a picture of this. He gets to the microphone and he said, that's all he said. Next to my covenant relationship with Jesus Christ, my covenant relationship with my wife is the most sacred thing I will carry. And if I were to ever violate that, you would not have to discuss that in this meeting. I would take this pen and I would personally go to the roster of this denomination and strike my name out of the, out of the I will have forfeited my privilege of leading families and leading other people. And he came back and sat down and they took a vote. And I don't know when the guy got back. I don't think he ever did. But, but that's, that's, my, that's, the, that's my family, right? That's, that's how my dad valued the obligation that we have, each of us, to treat each other with integrity. Which is why Peter, jumping now to chapter 2 and verse 1, says, Therefore, get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. I want to just, I'm, gonna, I'm closing with this. I want to go over the Greek meaning of each of those. Evil behavior, bent on doing harm to a brother or sister. Deceit, treachery, cunning, like using bait to trap somebody. Hypocrisy, outwardly play acting the part of love, but inwardly seeking your own advantage. Jealousy, desire for someone else's possessions, position, or achievement. Unkind speech, running another person down behind their backs. And our family obligation as sons and daughters of our father, as brothers and sisters to each other, is that we are to treat each other with integrity and grace and love and forbearance and forgiveness. All the grace that he's given us is the grace we're to extend each other because we carry brother, sister, son, daughter. That's who we are. 
That's our identity. And when the powers and principalities of darkness look down from their heavenly perspective and see Westgate Chapel, I want, them to, I want the righteous ones to be high-fiving each other and saying, look at how they love each other. Look at how they treat each other. That's the grace of God at work. That's the family of God at work. Would you stand with me, please?